Let's get straight to the point with views from both sides of the aisle. We now welcome Austin Barber and Brandon Jones to our MPB studios. Austin is a Republican strategist and founder of the Clearwater Group. Brandon is an attorney and former Democratic member of the Mississippi House of Representatives. Gentlemen, welcome back to Ad Issue. Thank you. Uh, All right. So transparency is the word of the week as leadership in both chambers have hinted conference hearings on hot issues like Medicaid expansion and education funding might be open to the public. This is a bit of a departure from past practices of doing these negotiations primarily behind closed doors. So, Brandon, you've been in that building. What do you make of a lead of leadership kind of pulling back the curtain and showing the people how the sausage is made as we get this close to uh, Sinodai? So I think we should welcome it. It's a good thing. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really pleased with what we hear coming out of both uh, Speaker White and Lieutenant Governor Hoseman. Um, you know, you heard us talk last week a little bit about process and some of the things that have irked us and mm-hmm. um, some examples of that. You know, Austin and I have talked offline. I was telling him, you know, I, I liked it whenever these chairmen would have these hearings and really get into all the weeds right out there in public. I think that's good for the process. And I heard... Lieutenant Governor Hoseman give lip service to that. Hey, this is good for the process. You end up with a better product. Mm -hmm. Where my skepticism is and where I think it it will remain until it happens is that uh, Lieutenant Governor Hoseman has had ample opportunity to do conference committees, all the conference committees out in the open. And under their rules, Austin, they're supposed to do that. Conference committees are supposed to be public under the joint rules of the House and Senate. We all know who observe the process. They hardly are. Um, Speaker Gunn was a pretty big, uh, I guess you'd say, anti-transparency guy. Um, and, and he wasn't afraid to say it. You know, he said, I think they ought to be able to do business on the telephone or, right. or however. Um, so, look, I, I am pleased that both of them are talking about this. Um, but this legislature has not historically in, in recent history shown a real commitment to transparency. So let's see. Let's see how the process plays out. I don't think I'll be the guy today to go be Mr. Anti-Transparency. So I won't, I won't lead with that. Well, that's a disappointment you know, you're, you're, to all you're of not, us. You're I, not I thought Brandon, to disagree. Yeah, so I thought Brandon may take that role, and that would have been easy for me to counter. <laughs> um, hey, listen, let me say this about Delbert Hoseman. I mean, every single committee hearing, committee meeting that happens in the Senate is online. You can literally go to your phone right now and go to YouTube and type in Mississippi Legislature, and you can see every single committee meeting for the last five years, including since this tw- year. Since 2020. Yeah. 2020. Okay. Yeah, my math is you know, four or five years, whatever. And that's because Delbert Hoseman has pushed that. So I got to take up for Delbert on that. The conference stuff, you remember the legislature, it is a little different for those who are like, what's this actually mean? Three House members, three Senate members um, that are driving the the negotiations on that specific bill. That's a little harder to do because they may decide to meet at 10 p.m. one night because they're all at the Capitol working on something, and it's a one-minute conversation. So I'm glad they're doing it on Medicaid expansion. I think it's a really good thing because there's you know so many people who are tuned in to Medicaid expansion. Um, but I think for it, it's really more difficult – um, to do for all for every single conference um, that 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 the legislature will have. I don't know how many they have a year. Dozens and dozens and dozens. Maybe what do you think? A hundred or more or less? Yeah, you know, I, I, that's a good question. I, I, it's a lot conference, to your point. Yeah, yeah it's a lot. I, I do think Austin. We should always hold them to that standard. Sure. Hey, you should absolutely make every effort sure. to do as much of this. And and conference committee is so vital because as we've all learned and talked about during the life of this show, um, the committee meetings that happen in February, they're important. Right. Don't get me wrong. But it's those conference committees at the very end when the laws are actually getting ironed out. And to your point, also, a lot of negotiations. Yeah, and it's and now. it's not and it's it's good for the public. It's also good for the membership because how many of these very busy members who might be on this conference committee might be on that one, but how many of those very busy members learn yeah. about what the actual bill says as they're sitting in those shotgun style hearings at the end of the session where it's like, all right, here's bill number one, here's bill yeah. number two, here's bill number three, yeah. and here's what we decided. And, and and again, so what happens? They go to conference, they 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 either come to an agreement or they don't come to an agreement. A bill could die in conference because there was no agreement. And you have to have two, two of the three members from each side, House and Senate, who agree to it. Then those conference reports go back to the House, go back to the Senate, and then must get a, a majority. 
majority vote or if it's a yeah. revenue bill. Both, both chambers must concur. There yeah. you go. Easier way to say it. And then the governor's got to either sign it or veto. So the membership's going to get a report, but – uh, this is really interesting. I'm, I look forward to watching it or, or trying to be in the room when this happens. There are two little transparency nuggets. One of them you made me think about. So you're, you're right. anti-transparency. You Senate, did say that. <laughs> Senate um, uh, has been doing their work online in, in committee. Yeah. The House doesn't. This, this, I think this is a great moment, and, and I, will, I hope every member of the media is pushing really hard for this. It's a great moment for the House to do the same thing. Yeah. These meetings should be online. Yeah. It's, it's helpful. It's just it's educational for people. It's educational for membership. But then that transparency element, gosh, Hoseman is absolutely correct when he says you get a better product when you do it yeah. this way because you, you get more eyeballs on the process. You get more input. So that's one thing. It'd be great if the House joined the Senate. they'd get there soon. That'd be good because it looks like, to his yeah. credit, Speaker White has a yeah. – inclination mm -hmm. towards being more open with the process. Um, but then the other thing is the open meetings law in Mississippi is very interesting. You know, we have a reverse repealer on next year, not a reverse repealer. We have a repealer on that bill, which means the legislature has to vote each year to keep the open records law in place. So the open meetings law in place. Mm -hmm. And in this context of talking about sunshine and talking about transparency, um, that's a really weird, bad piece of public policy that each year the Open Meetings Act has to be repassed or we don't have an Open Meetings Act. There's been a couple of moments, uh, I recall two and three years ago, where that stuff didn't get ironed out until the end and there was a moment where it looked like it wasn't going to pass. Um, we should hold these people's feet to the fire to say do as much of this stuff in public as you can. And while we're at it, let's open up the books on all this stuff. Let's look at all of it. You know, the legislature has exempted themselves from a ton right. of they ethics and, and open requirements that other bodies have to maintain. Um, they've exempted themselves from the public meetings number. Like, what does it constitute a, a public meeting that you have to let public in for and some content but one of the one i think one of the hottest issues regarding this is the the house caucus the republican caucus in the house which represents a super majority because um because they have a super majority in the house and i know that that's been a question um regarding the open meetings act if, so if, if a lawsuit. yeah exactly this is that if if the the caucus meeting since it represents a a, a number uh, of, of of elected officials that could pass legislation that if it falls under and right now the uh, the i guess the adjudication is no um they're not technically subject to the open meeting which they law. shouldn't be they're they're a political organization essentially in in when they're doing those meetings and and the republican caucus or uh the conservative caucus which we used to have or the black caucus or the democrat caucus mm -hmm. or whomever whatever the you know the 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 grandma caucus, whatever it is, they should be able to go have a conversation about what's the grandma caucus for today. Right. And they ought to be able to have those. This is my not my opinion. They better have those conversations together in private, without the press, whatever. And then they'll come out and they'll have to take a very public opinion when, when they vote. Same thing happens in Washington. Not, maybe that's not the best example of what happens in Washington we ought to do here. But that's <laughs> happened for a long time where Republicans and Democrats can have caucus meetings to determine, hey, what do we— how do we feel about this specific issue? I think theoretically you're right, but the reason, but if you if you think that these conversations are happening among discrete caucuses who they themselves can't do something to ch enact a law or to enact a change, I think you're right. But whenever you have the numbers to change the law, that's why we don't let the majority of the city council go out to lunch together without making sure that it's an open meeting. Because when you have the numbers to change the law or to change the ordinance, then it becomes a different situation. Now you're having a conversation that actually can change the way things are. So, look, I, we could probably debate that. Yeah. I, I think the point, I, I'm really glad. We're not going to decide it right that's now. Right. That's right. I, I mean, I, what I would say is I'm really glad they both said this. And I think we ought to say let's use this as an opportunity. First of all, you're exactly right. Let's have the Medicaid expansion conference where people can access it and where people can weigh in because it's such an important conversation. Let's try to get it right. But then let's see what we can do to expand, expand and extend this. I think people like me, Austin, I think I'd come in here a lot less frustrated sometimes if we just knew what was happening. You know, we talk about a lot of these issues and I'll come in here and I'll be ranting and raving or frustrated about this or that and or wondering what the motivation of this person is you take all that stuff out 
if the policy stuff is getting ironed out in a public setting. But Brandon, and I, I know we got to get off this. No, okay. It is so much better in terms of what's happening, the people knowing what's happening, than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. And most of that is because of technology that a guy in Boonville can can log in and see what the gaming committee is is up to or the finance committee. It is so much better. I know you're an insider, okay, because you understand this process. You're a former member of the legislature. You want to – you're into the minutia wanting to, to know – I think the average person um, sort of feels like, hey, if I really want to find out, I can at least go click on YouTube, click on the legislative website. I think it's a lot better now. I know it's a lot better now than it was again 10, 20, or 50 years ago. And I know we got to. Well, I think we're more connected. I would just say this. I I, I think the process itself was a little bit more open. But to your point, I agree. Yeah, at least whenever I served, I, I felt like, okay, I know what the bill says. You know, we've, we've had hearing. I, I, never, I never got a 200-page bill dropped on me that I'd never heard of before mm-hmm. on the floor of the House and then have to vote on it that day. Um, but putting all that aside, you're right. We have other and different and easier ways towards connectivity, and we ought to be using all those tools, to your point, let people get connected. I do wonder, too, though, he mentioned it, you know, yeah, I do think you're right. People are busy with their own lives. They're busy taking care of their own business. They probably don't pay as close attention as people like me wish they would. And I think leadership always benefits from that. So that's why you kind of have to bang the drum. That's why members of the news media, others kind of have to say, yeah, y'all be as open as you can so that people can really know what's happening. All right, you made a plea just a second ago to try to you know get it right when it comes to transparency and all that other thing uh, and everything else when it comes to this especially with this Medicaid conversation um, you know the the uh, Senate minority leader has made a plea uh, to be to that a Democrat be included in the Senate's conferees um, now we saw how the thing how, how Medicaid expansion and their plan kind of went in the Senate and this the Senate needs Democratic votes. To, to pass Medicaid expansion. So is the right thing to, to I mean, I'm asked both of these, the right thing to include uh, a Democratic, a Democrat on, on the list of conferees? Well, let me say something kind of general philosophical, and then I'll say something indivi- about the individuals involved. So generally, philosophically, um, Republicans don't need Democrats to do much in Mississippi. Mm-hmm. But when they start having to get super majorities, that's when that type of uh, – you know, cooperation becomes much more important. So just generally speaking, there's a math concern. Mm -hmm. The other part is, Austin, and I'll kick it to you, the two people that have the ear of their caucuses and who are leaders over there, Robert Johnson in the House and Derek Simmons in the Senate, when you get to moments like this, it is procedural and political malpractice not to have both of those men on those committees because they are both reasonable well, they both have the ears of their committee, and they can help to bring people along so that if yeah. you have those people agreeing with the product, you have a much better likelihood of getting your numbers in terms of what you need to pass a supermajority. So I think procedurally and philosophically it's a good idea, but then also those two guys are just good at what they do, and they can help bring people with them. Yeah, don't get frustrated yet. The committees, the committees have not been have not been. That's named. right. I know. Um, so listen. Brandon mentioned this when you know when you have a supermajority, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, unless your supermajority is split on an issue, which, this which is, is one where, of them. which is where uh, the Republican Party, uh, members of the Republican Party in the in the Senate to a lesser degree in the House are on uh, uh, on Medicaid waiver program, uh, which is which is what's being debated in the Senate. Because if it gets vetoed, they got to find a two thirds. They got to find two thirds to override the governor's veto. It's going to be very, very close. It, it is. But um, and listen, I, I, I definitely agree with with Brandon that that Robert Johnson and Derek Simmons are excellent legislators. Uh, I may not agree with them on every issue. They're smart men, smart. I, I think I, I know both of them are lawyers. Um, Robert's a lawyer too, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm sure that they are at the, the top of the list to be considered for, for um, members of the conferees uh, in both the House and the Senate. We'll ultimately see what the speaker decides and what the what the lieutenant governor decides. I mean, Hob Bryan is the chairman of public health mm-hmm. uh, in the Senate. He is a Democrat. So on any health care-related issues, 
Um, Hobbs probably, if not the longest serving member of the Senate, he That's is right point. there. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't. I don't think this is a problem. I don't think this is a concern. I don't think it's anything we should be worried about right now because Democrats certainly have a voice uh, in both chambers on this issue. Okay. Um, we'll pivot. Um, we hear a lot from some lawmakers, Republican Representative Trey Lamar as an example, that Mississippi's in the best financial shape it's ever been in. Those lawmakers like to cite the budget surplus uh, as their proof. But recently, S&P Global Ratings downgraded Mississippi's financial outlook from stable to negative. That's not the same as a credit rating, just to be clear. Um, we can get into the details as we discuss. But Austin, I know you have, you'll have you have some thoughts on this. Um, great financial shape and negative outlook don't seem to be congruent. So what are your thoughts? Um, well, listen, I'm no expert on this. But from what I understand from people who I do deem experts who, who really read the study, and I did not, um, they said, listen, they're, they're, again, this is not a credit downgrade. Correct. This is a... Uh, you know, we saw a lot of tornado watches and tornado warnings in Jackson and across Mississippi. This is a, hey, this is a watch and a warning uh, for Mississippi's credit rating. And from what I understand, it is they're, they're, they are concerned. They want to see after the tax cuts that we've had, what are, what are the actual revenue numbers that are coming in over the next year or so forth. There are other big issue that they're worried about, and I'm worried about this too, and we all should be, is our population growth. It's it's pretty stagnant, to be honest with you. When you when you um, when you look at um, the last census, um, we we grew just a little bit, thankfully, but better than not growing. Um, but I think those are the two issues for the most part. And of course, PERS, the twenty something million dollars in, in in unfunded you know liability that the state has there. So those three issues, you know. What's going to happen with the tax cuts? Mm -hmm. uh, are we going to have revenue growth? Or are we going to lose revenues? Yes, sir. And to that point, you have, we still have a governor that wants to see further cuts to income taxes. That's right. So, um, so that, this is what was in the report. They're, they want to they want to see that. They want to see those revenue numbers and then make it a determination off that. They you know concerned about our population growth not being as, as significant as a lot of our neighbors. Uh, and then, of course, thirdly is the issue with PERS, which the legislature is debating uh, right now. So, look, I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about our population growth. As the father of, a, of an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old, one is about to go to college, I want him to come to, you know, stay in Mississippi after he leaves college. The same with my daughter, as I know you do, too. Um, and, you know, that's why we got to have the right types of industry and jobs and places to live. Quality of life matters so much. I just had lunch in Fondren, and it's, it's I just love to see all the growth there. 22, 23, 24, 25-year-olds, they want to come back to a place after college where they can have a lot of fun and have a really good job. And th there are opportunities for that uh, in Jackson and in Mississippi, but we need more of them. All right. Same. I mean, same thing to you, Brandon. Great financial shape on one hand, negative outlook on the other. You know how? I mean, don't seem congruent. No, they're they're not. And look, this is this is a I, I would call it canary in the coal mine, but this is actually consistent with what we've heard and known for some time. Um, there's no state in the history of the United States that has had uh, tremendous economic growth by virtue of cutting its taxes to the bone. That's just that's just not the way that money works and ever has worked. Um, I, I, it's a popular thing to throw out there because it's just kind of a red meat, easy to do thing. But when the bill comes due and you no longer have revenue to do the things that you want to do, such as infrastructure, such as have hospitals, such as those are quality of life things, which, you know, I don't know of anybody who wants to move to places where they can't have a road or where they can't have a hospital or where the public library is closing because there's no longer any public funding to keep it open. And so these are things that we all know. And, and whenever they passed this tremendous tax cut um, not too long ago, uh, we knew the bill was going to come due and that it could be pretty bad for us. I'm actually surprised that you're already beginning to see the con contours of that from an economic perspective, because I actually thought with all the infusion of federal money that we got during COVID, um, that this economy would be propped up for longer. But it's actually not holding on as well as it did. Lamar has never been fully transparent, since we've been using that word today, about why our economy was so r uh, robust in 2020. It was primarily because of federal dollars that were sent down here. Um, and the federal dollars are still pretty much propping up 
the the surplus that they, they point are to in all many the ways. This is like you've moved out of the house and your parents have been paying for your rent, and they're still paying for your rent, and your bank account looks okay because they're covering rent, but then they're about to in that period where they're paying for your rent and you're about to have to find your own insurance and we're going to be left with our tax cut program to pay for rent and for our insurance. So I do think there's some glaring realities that Mississippi faces. And I, you know, you and I do agree, Austin, with like where we want to be. We want this to be an attractive place to live. We want people to be here. Part of the way you do that is by passing Medicaid expansion, making sure you have roads, making sure you have robust public schools, those things that cost money. And that's where... This is a frightening prospect. Again, it's a it's a prospectus. There are things that the legislature can do to improve it. But you, we would be Pollyanna if we didn't say, yeah, it's not great. Yeah, I, look, I applaud Trey Lamar. I like Trey. We're about the same age. Both have young kids. Um, he, he is not scared to do things that are bold, okay, that others may look at and be concerned about. Um, and, and he is – he is a, an absolute leader in, in the legislature, not just the House, but the whole Capitol, who's not scared to say, look, this is what I believe in. This is what I'm going to go fight for. When we look at the budget situation, you know, the expenditures last year for the general fund were six billion six hundred and something million dollars. They put at least but the but the revenues, the total revenues that came in was of over a billion dollars more. Maybe it was like nine hundred and fifty million dollars. So close to um that that much more money that they just didn't spend. We are 150, 175 million dollars over the revenue estimate right now. Money coming in from state tax dollars is is not a problem. Now there is interest that we are earning that's helping right now because of all the money that we have, the cash basically in the bank and the capital expense fund and the rainy day fund. So I, I you and I just kind of see this differently. Um, and ultimately, neither one of us are going to predict, well, this is where tax revenues are going to be in 2027. Um, and so it's impossible for us to have it, which I think I'm, I'm pretty confident that is where these rating agencies are saying, you know, when we look out, in the future, this is our concern for Mississippi, but the reality is we won't know until we get there. It, it should effectively close the conversation that the governor and that Mr. Lamar want to have about expanding the tax cut situation. And I, this should be to them the cold, the cold water to the face that says, settle down for a minute. E even if we presume that you know more than these rating agencies, which I think is questionable. Yeah. Um, even if we were to presume that, we need to see what this looks like in a year or two. And so the notion that we would use this moment of uncertainty to hit the gas on on, on tax cuts, I think, is, is irresponsible. And I would hope a report like this would say, yeah, enough of that. Yeah, 15-second response. Sure. Because I know we got to probably hop here. I don't really see much conversation about a tax cut happening this late in the no, session. No, there has not been much so conversation. I, I, and I think when I think when Chairman Lamar talks about it, he's thinking about 25, 26, and so forth. When you hear the governor talk about it, Brandon, I don't think they're talking about this session. We have too many issues with PERS and education and Medicaid expansion that have dominated the session, and they're going to dominate the next two or three weeks as well. Well, one thing that – came up in response to that from both of you were, you know, the, the need for infrastructure and roads. Um, and we've recently heard um, a loud call uh, from the transportation commissioners for more funding to do just that. Um, so, Austin, I, 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 you made this a point of interest. Yes. Um, you know, what do, what, do, what do we take from the commissioners being this upfront and public about the need for more funding, uh, you know, especially the North the North Commissioner, where I know they have lots of ambition to to do more capacity projects. They need lots of money. Yeah, well, well, they do. And John Caldwell, who's the Northern Commissioner, sat beside his fellow two commissioners on Tuesday outside of MDOT, and said, "Hey, listen, legislators, my friends across the street, don't let infrastructure, highways." bridges, roads, um, airports, sewer systems. Don't let it be the fourth priority or the fifth priority behind all these other things. We can do everything. We can do all these things. And, you know, sadly, sometimes infrastructure just kind of gets put to the side. It's not as sexy. Yeah, there you go. It's not as sexy as education funding and Medicaid. But, my gosh, it's important. If, if you have driven south of Memphis – 
on I-55 into South Haven headed towards Hernando, you know how bad it is. I-55 I right here in Madison County, on the coast, 25 in Rankin County. These are all called capacity projects. Uh, Oxford, uh, Highway 7, the capacity projects mean essentially what you would think. We're beyond capacity. We can't take any more cars. We can't put any more businesses to the east or the west or the north or south of this highway. We have got to six lane them, eight lane them, four lane them, whatever it is. Four of the highest growing counties in Mississippi right now, DeSoto, Lafayette, Rankin, and Madison are all waiting to have projects expanded. And it just takes legislative money. The legislature spent a, put a bunch of money in MDOT last year for some big capacity projects. If they'll just level fund sort of what they did last year, this year, that will take those four counties that I have for the most part and get their projects done. And then it lets Warren County move up, Jackson County, whatever is next, move up this list. So important. DeSoto is leading the state in, in population growth. It can't continue to lead the state if if they don't if these businesses don't have places to put their trucks and put their people. Sorry, I'm a bit long winded, but I'm very passionate about this. No, no notes. It's perfect. <laughs> you hit it on the head, and that's why your government's got to have money. Yeah. Infrastructure is a quality of life issue. Mm -hmm. Your your condition of your roads may seem like just a minor annoyance or or, or a good thing, depending on where you live, but it is so much deeper than that. Um, it, it is it is one of those things that drives investment in a state. It's one of those things that drives satisfaction among citizens of a state. Um, and so it, it's just deep. And, and, you know, you mentioned too, it goes deeper than roads as well. When we talk, we, and we have on this program, talked about water systems. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people like to beat up on Jackson. Jackson is not especially unique in terms of having outdated, outmoded water systems. Um, we have that problem in many parts of our state. Um, similar with sewage, things of that nature. So when we think about infrastructure, it goes much deeper than just this surface level stuff, airports, ports, this, on and on and on. And so we do have to think, I think, deeply about this. And, and I'm glad I'm glad they kind of raised that alarm yeah. because we should always be thinking and, about it. And the it. legislature put a lot of money, specifically additional dollars, M to N dot, M dot for you know, paving and um, I think there was an infrastructure week. Projects. I think they finally had infrastructure week in the federal government. They <laughs> yeah. got dollars. So, so, Thanks, so, Uncle Joe. But so, but the, but the state put I think five or six hundred million dollars on top of it into that. So they recognize it, but you got to do that again, and you got to do that again. So this is a really important issue. I hate to say it's not sexy, but nobody wants to be stuck in traffic in, in anywhere in Mississippi. And we have some places that, thank the Lord, have some population growth and economic growth. We need them. Yeah, and I don't think many people want to replace the the axles on their cars more than like you know once in the car's lifetime either. That's right. Yeah. Well, well, if you live in Jackson. <laughs> All right. Yeah, any final thoughts? No, I just I, I'm I'm. I'm thinking as we look ahead, uh, we didn't have a chance to get to it today, but we had said last week that there's a difference in like something being dead and it oh, being yeah. dead, dead. You know, the education bill came back. Oh, yeah. I know the as, House Inspire That's Act. right. That's so as we head towards the final days of this session, Hearst came back. we'll have more conversations yeah. about, all right, some of the stuff that we thought was going, this is how they get rejuvenated. And that's another process conversation for another time. Yeah, and it will be. That'd be uh, certainly, we have, we have a few more weeks of this, and we can certainly get into those issues. This has been at issue on MPB Think Radio, a weekly discussion about the 2024 Mississippi Legislative Session. You can catch us live each Friday at 6.30. At issue can be streamed on demand on the MPB Public Media app, or you can subscribe to the At Issue podcast. Each week's podcast includes an extended version of our weekly interview, as well as an extended version of our roundtable discussion. And if you'd like to see what we look like, the full interview and roundtable are available on YouTube. Just search Mississippi Public Broadcasting at Issue. I'm Michael Gidry from all of us at MPB. Thanks for listening.